I am super enthusiastic today to introduce you to my friend, Halim Flowers. He is an incredibly inspiring young man who went through enormous challenges. He's going to tell us his story about being wrapped up into this nation's wrong spirited commitment to mass incarceration. He went through decades in prison, but that never killed his hope. In fact, this man became a superhero. He's a hero to me. And if you're serving time or going into the system, you need to see what excellence looks like. You're going to get an opportunity to see it because he's, he's done so many amazing things since he's been home. Halim Flowers, welcome to the Prison Professors Program. I'm, I'm just so grateful to have you on our show. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'm blessed and honored to, to finally be here. Yeah, because it's been a long, long journey, and I'd like to give just a little bit of backstory here on, on why this show took place. I was uh, working with a policy advisor who's striving to improve outcomes of America's criminal justice system. Her name is Kara, and while during our conversation, she asked me if I knew Halim Flowers, and I said, I do know him, and I started searching. In fact, I can do it right now. I'll, I'll, I'll weave it into the editing of this. But I searched through my mailbox inbox, and I saw that he had corresponded with me years ago um, when he was still in prison. Tell us about that, how, how you and I came into, into contact, Talim. Um, Similar to your story, uh, when you was in prison, you know, being punished for doing the right thing. And... Um, DC legislators in 2016, I was able to get them to, through my life story, to, to uh, change the resentencing laws and respect the juveniles um, getting life sentences in the District of, Colum District of Columbia. So as soon as the law was enacted um, as a punishment to me, the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons sent me from West Virginia, which is closer to DC, and I was in an FCI institution and they sent me to a, a USP in Atwater, California. So like as soon as the law passed and I was going to need to have access to my attorneys and my mitigation specialists as a punishment, they sent me back to a high security prison in California, um, just as you were sent to Colorado. And that's when it was a blessing because, you know, I know everything happens for a reason. And when I got there, uh, the warden, I forgot the warden's name. At this Andre time. Matavusian. Matavusio, yeah. He, uh, he, he, he was pushing your program at that time. And one of the guys that had attended your university, he had, had a copy of some of your books. And I was able to read uh, your books. And that's how your email was in the book and I emailed you. Yeah, so I was just uh, really so happy for you when you got out. I saw a picture, I think it was your mother welcoming you into the community. And, uh, you know, but, but when I spoke with Kara, she told me when she first met you, I think it was at Fairton. Is that right? Yeah, in New Jersey. In New Jersey. So I was in Fairton, New Jersey, God, back in like 2000 and maybe, no, it was like 1996, I think I was in Fairton. And I, I mean, I remember the prison for me, it was a good prison because I had come down from a high security and it was in a medium. And so it was kind of OK. But she told me that when she met you, you were only like 17 or 18 years old and serving a life sentence already. And, and she said she when she first met you, you were already filled with that hope, knowing that you were going to change your change your the story of your life and get out. Tell us about what you remember about that meeting. Um, actually, when I met. Uh, Kerr, I had about 17 years in. Oh, so 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 it wasn't at the start of Fairton, it no. was much later. Yeah, I didn't I started out in um, you know, I'm from the district district of Columbia. Yeah, so did you so start out in Lorton? Yeah, I started out in Lorton. So uh -huh. once the Clintons closed uh Lorton, then we started our this sport journey throughout the Federal Bureau of Prisons. But um actually I read an article in the in the Washington Post about the Correction Informational Council, um, how they, well, I used to always, because I'm, I'm a jailhouse lawyer, so we know we do research. So in research, I found that the, uh, the mayor's office of the District of Columbia had, had enacted the, um, what's known as the Correction Information Council, a body of people who would be concerned with the care of incarcerated people from the District of Columbia. So the uh, they when you would look into the footnotes on in the law, it would say not funded, not funded, not funded. 
So the article came out, I think it was like 2013 or maybe 12 uh, that they finally was funded. And this was like about like my 15th year, 16th year. In. And, um, and, and where were you it. incarcerated then? I was in Ferguson. So so how much time did you do in Lorton? Uh, like about two years, two years. And then, and then you were in Fairton for that many years, 15 years. No, no. I was, uh, two years in Lawton. Then they sent me to a state prison for two years. And then I went to Lewisburg for six years and then Ferntown for five years and USP Atlanta where you was at for like two years and West Virginia, you know how they move us around. Yeah. So you started in Lewisburg. I, I went through Lewisburg. That was a, that, that was a super uh, volatile spot. What was your experience like in Lewisburg? Um, for As a me, young boy. I mean, you were only what, at the, when you were in Lewisburg, you were only about what, 20 years 21, old? 21. 21. I was yeah. like, the first time I was in Lewisburg, I think I was probably 25. What was, a, what was your experience like at 21? I know there was a lot of DC guys there. Yeah, it was a lot of, for me, um, by the time I had got to Ferntown, I had been in for, I mean, by the time I got to Lewisburg, I had been in for five years. Right. So for me, the most volatile uh, institution was at DC jail, the juvenile tier. Mm -hmm. You know, all guys under 18, everybody facing life sentence. That's when we filmed the the uh, Thug Life in DC documentary that ended up being aired on HBO and won an Emmy Award in 1998. But um, that was the most volatile, the most violent environment. So by the time I left the DC jail uh, juvenile tier, when I went to Lorton when I was 17, I already was seasoned in the volatility of prison. So, and then after Lorton, you know, going to Lewisburg, it just was like, you know, I was another I, part of just, the journey. It's just another part of the journey. I knew how to, I had, was five years in, I knew how to conduct myself. I always was like a little old man. So when I got to Lewisburg, I just was like, just get introduced to like um, financial literacy and like yeah. really being invested in it. So my thing, when I got to Lewisburg, I was like, I want to go to the feds and I just want to learn about all different people, all different religions, anybody from anywhere but D.C. So I hung with anybody but people from D.C. Nobody knew I was from D. Everybody thought I was from Philly. I just did a self-portrait. And one of the things I put was super predator. I was incarcerated at the age of 16 and given two life sentences. For me, growing up during the crack era, the culture is calling young black boys fatherless, godless, and jobless. We have predators on our streets. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are super predatory. In a hyper-capitalist society like America, poverty is just violent. It was so easy for us to destroy each other. We you find yourself inside of a cage as a child. It's not meant for me to be around any people, places, or things that I love. I was alone with all of my pain. But my childhood friend, Mama Lou Stewart, is a rapper. And just being around him, I just started like freestyle rapping. Come on, baby. Go ahead, man. Right. Like the SG. He gave me that seed to blossom into poetry. I was liberated. I learned how to love myself. That's what I needed to become an artist. When I go to the canvas, there's something that I had to say that was meant for the world to see. My life is an example of the potential that lays dormant inside of these walls. You have so much genius right here and it's just dormant. I'm fighting for y'all on the outside. I love y'all. People want you to run away from your past. They say that we were super predators. I'm turning this into a superhero who loves unconditionally. There is power in that. So, 
so going through that process with a long sentence and 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 people kind of you know the system kind of extinguishes hope where we find power is listening to a story of people like you for me it was really reading about Malcolm X and Viktor Frankl and Nelson Mandela they gave me hope because i knew that i had to do multiple decades in there but i knew that the decisions i made inside were going to have a huge influence on how i got out and mm. i i didn't get out one day early but it really positioned me to build a successful life when i got out and i know that's what you did as well were you successful in pushing out all of the negative influences even while you were in one of the most volatile federal prisons in the nation yeah for me um of course you know when you first went to prison back then versus now um you got Malcolm X first right and his stay wasn't as long as ours you know for yeah. decades but his ability to develop uh strength through uh the development of his vocabulary right because what we you and I learned two guys who litigated throughout our process we didn't just lay down we was actually litigating trying to get out we learned the power of words being jailhouse lawyers and when you study uh criminal law and civil law any any anglo-saxon american western based law it goes back to latin so when you go back to latin you learn the etymology of words and you learn the power of words and how to compose them and put them together and through uh my relationship with words whether it was reading them writing them speaking them um i be, i i i knew that i was on this i felt it you know, like even like you know, you know, you and I, we both met our wives while we were incarcerated. So we know the power of a love letter in a poem. So as I was taking in these stories, as you said, with like Victor Frankel, uh, Man Search for Meaning, Nelson Mandela, Geronimo Pratt, Asada Shakur, Angela Davis, you know, all of these people who went through incarceration, uh, nationally or internationally, uh, whether it was a Holocaust or, or a penal institution, we were able to draw strength from those words. The stories is the story is composed with words. And we were using words to be heard, whether it was our wives, whether it was a judge, whether I might read an article in the Newsweek uh, by Dr. Elaine Pagels at Princeton University and wrote her a letter. And she's the one who sent me Victor Frankel book. Um, it just was a journey of words that were internally just giving me that hope. And once I had that hope, I I didn't even see my immediate uh, carceral culture because I knew I knew that I was worthy of more. It wasn't that I just wanted more. I just had an indwelling spirit that was telling me that I, I was worthy of more. Halim, it's funny you mentioned Princeton. And what was that lady's name? Dr. Elaine Pagels. And, and you came into contact with her because you read something and then you wrote her a letter? Yeah, I, um, I, it was an article in the Newsweek. Um, I was in a law library at uh, USP Lewisburg, and one of my mentors, a jailhouse lawyer named Michael Norwood, he told me, he said, because I started a publishing company and published my first book, and he said, you need to start writing newspaper and magazine editors about your story. You have a powerful story. You have a film, a documentary that's out there that's being seen worldwide. And he said, I think you can gain your freedom more through the public awareness of you and your story more than just through the courts. That's right. So I started like reading these. I mean, I, I was always reading these periodicals and it was an article about Dr. Elaine Pagels, her journey as why she started um, her career into studying religion and Christianity, how when she was a teenager, one of her Jewish friends had died in a car accident and one of her peers said that's sad that they going to hell and she was like why would you say they going to hell that they were a good person you know a good person and the person was looking at it from a, 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 a um a theological you know Lens. Uh, po a point of view and she just couldn't yeah. understand it so that's when she started going to college to study religion and, and for me i saw the intersectionality i wouldn't write anyone unless i saw intersectionality and I saw the intersectionality of how her uh, journey of self-discovery started as a teenager through fatality. And my journey as a human being started as a teenager through civil fatality. Like I was killed civilly and socially, you know, yeah. 
labeled a super predator of menace to society, but it began a different journey that began a different life and a different trajectory for me. The reason that that was imp- powerful, what you just said, do you know what year that was? Oh, she actually still has the letter because we're filming a new documentary now. I think she said it was 2004. So here's yeah. the here's the connection. I don't know if you read this or remember reading this in Earning Freedom, but in 1992 or 93, there was another professor at Princeton University. His name was John Diulio, and he John Diulio is actually the professor that coined the term super predator. Right. And he published an article in the Wall Street Journal. It was called Let Him Rot. And mm. I did exactly what you did. I wrote him a letter. I didn't know how to get his address. I just wrote Dr. Diulio, Princeton University. I was in USP Atlanta at the time mm. and basically told him why I disagreed with what he wrote. What he mm. wrote is that, you know, we need more prisons. We need to lock them up for a longer period of time because there are super predators coming and so on and so forth. And, and I wrote him, I said, you know, I just think that's the opposite of what we need. We need to pr- instill seeds of hope and help people discover themselves and become more educated. And, and that would be far better for society. And that led, ironically, that led to a relationship with me and Dr. Diulio. And mm-hmm. he eventually one time brought a class from Princeton to come visit me in another prison in McKean. Mm-hmm. So it's really coincidental that you guys, we, we have these similarities. We both served a long sentence. We're both really recognized through the teaching of Malcolm X, the power of developing language. And that's why these courses that I create, that I send into prisons, I really emphasize people, invest in yourself, invest in learning to develop language skills, writing skills, uh, verbal communication skills, because then you can build a network. And I know that that's what you did, not only become skilled as a writer and a poet and an artist, but you were able to bring people into your life that would start advocating for you. And that's continuing on to this day. And it may very well be the reason that you're home with us today. Exactly. Um, Tell us more about your, the evolution of your journey going through Lewisburg and where you went next and, and how you were able to avoid the complications that derail uh, adjustments for so many other people. Um, for me, um, where'd you go after Lewisburg? After Lewisburg, I went to Ferenton, and I just remember, like, you know, and I wrote about this in my book, Get Into Ferenton versus Lewisburg. I couldn't, but when we pulled up to the institution, I was like, they're not going to let me in here. That's the first thing I thought, like, because my first nine years was always, like, behind a wall, you know, and Ferenton was like being in the college campus. Yeah. And I actually chose Ferenton because they had the college program there. Yeah. So, um, but I had started my publishing company in 2005, um, published two books while I was at Lewisburg, had the opportunity to, uh, to, co- to connect with professors and students at Bucknell University uh-huh. and have my books used as a part of the curriculum. There, and I just actually was going through my old papers. And I saw a report that one of the students wrote about me and my book in Bucknell in 2005. And um, so that was a blessing. But I knew that I wanted more formal education instead of being self-taught. So I chose to go to Ferns and I was able to go to the college. Miss uh, Elizabeth Skedzileski, the head of education there, had a great uh, program with Cumberland uh, County Community College. And I was able to um, have the opportunity to study business formally. And I really believe once I learn um, the formal terminologies of business, I kind of took the, the Malcolm X prison uh, to prosperity uh, pipeline algorithm and, and I updated the software because I realized like, you know what? What he did was good for the time of the civil rights movement, but now we're more in need of studying the uh Instead of the Webster's Dictionary, we more need to study the Burns finance, Burns finance and accounting uh, and real estate uh, dictionaries. Right so on. that's what I did. I started studying those three. Uh, it was accounting, finance, real estate, and uh, business law dictionaries published by the Burns uh, publication. And I studied those dictionaries from A to Z because I knew that I had my spiritual self intact. 
um, my civil self intact, but I knew that I wanted, I knew what type of lifestyle that I wanted to live uh, economically. And I knew that I was a philanthropist in heart, but if I really wanted to scale my desire to really be able to help people on the inside and on the outside who shared my lived experience, that it would take uh, self enterprise and economic empowerment. And that's like, from Ferntin, uh, and I was obsessed with it. You got to understand, like I have a, like I just designed this sneaker right here, right? And I went to, uh, this is the first sneaker that I designed in my fashion line. Let me and see I it. To, Hold that up again. That's inspiring. Yeah. yeah, this. Turn that around. That is awesome. Who's the manufacturer? Um, the manufacturer is is I'm in partnership with a, a company called Flip Space. Right so on. we manufacture this. We manufacture the sneakers out of China, and we manufacture this cap and the bag. These come out of France. Oh my God, that's amazing! Yeah. And how are you? Yeah. How so? So if people want to support that program, and of course I'll put a link mm -hmm. on this video. How can they order this amazing art? And we're going to get into how you became an artist. How can they? How can they do that? What What website do they need to go to? Um. I, I'm going to say everything begins with me, uh, my name at Halloween Flowers at Instagram. I'm an Instagrammer. Um, yeah. But the website for the fashion is uh, www.flyp, period, S-P-A-C-E dot com at flip, uh, it's, 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 uh, flip dot space dot com. Oh, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna make sure that we put links to all of your 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 uh, amazing artwork, but your story. Keep telling us your story because you know the people that are watching this, they're all in jail and prison. We I create these volunteer to create these types of programs, and we put them on DVDs or we send them into jails and prisons because we want to reach people like you that that mm -hmm. when they come in without hope, we got to give them hope, and you are the personification of hope but you really created your own pathway by doing exactly what you said, developing strong uh, communication skills and an insane self-directed work ethic, which made all the difference in the world for you. So, so you become an artist, walk us through a little bit more further down the journey. Um, and, and I'd love to hear about, you know, what, how you, we connected through at Atwater, how, how that happens. And then, and then, cause you got released from Atwater, right? That's where you got out. Well, I went back to the writ to DC jail from Atwater and I got released. But Atwater was definitely my last spot in the front uh -huh. of the prison. So And you were in Atwater for how many years? Like almost two years. So, but you were not there when I went to Atwater and gave the speech. No, I got there in December 2016. You had just came. Okay. Before but, I got there. But everybody but did was you write me it. or somebody write me from on your behalf from yeah. Atwater? Who was that? Yeah. Um, I think it was, I was in a challenge program and I got uh, the coordinator, his name was- um, Van Horn? No, his name was Greer. Okay. I think that was his name, Greer. So, so some Art kind of way I heard about you back then. And then I think I heard about you when when you first got out from somebody else as well, I think it was a filmmaker. Yeah. I, um, it was unchanged read, stories or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, um, Christian and uh -huh. So Christian, I met Christian while I was at, uh, USB Atwater. She was a filmmaker in DC who was doing films about, uh, juveniles and young adults in, in the penal system. And once the, Ira legislation was passed, she wanted to start a, 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 a company where though she would provide film services uh, to those who were coming back to be resentenced. So she would go interview your, your parents, your family, your community members, your supporters. And then when you would have your resentencing her and as a juvenile lifer, you would be able to submit this as evidence to your, uh, to your judge. So they call like mitigation specialist videos. So Christian and I, while I was at USP Atwater, we started a company called Unchained uh, Media to be able to not only um, provide that video services for incarcerated returning citizens that were returning for resentencing, um, 
under the Juvenile Life Law in DC, but also to, to be a platform to connect creatives on the inside with the people, places, and things that they would need to scale their talent and their commercial viability while they were on the inside and to help them transition um, successfully on the outside as creatives, writers, artists, you know, musicians, all these talented people that who I'm speaking to right now, who, who are in prison, who write books, who can sing or rap or, you know, who can paint and draw, but don't have access to the, uh, the publishing companies and literary agents and art galleries and museums and art dealers and curators. So uh, we created Unchained Media to be that pipeline, that connection point um, for those creatives on the inside. So, so when I was in prison doing that kind of work, that was one of the ways that I had challenges with the system is they would frequently accuse me of running a business or mm -hmm. doing something along those lines. Did you have any experience or what, what experience did you have with accusations that you're turning your hard work and your talent that you worked so hard to develop into a business? Did, 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 could, you, could you tell us if there were any experiences you had with, with accusations of running a business? Yeah, of course, you know, it, it varies from institution to institution. And in Lewisburg, it's ironic. In Lewisburg, which is predominantly uh, white community, uh, they celebrated it. You know, they praised it. They were so proud of me. Like, you know, um, when I came out with my books, it's like I was the mayor of Lewisburg. Like the guards, just, it was just like a deference in a, in a high regard and respect. And it was the same thing in Farrington as well. But when I went to USP Atlanta in 2013, what was strange was that um, they had a problem with it. And I didn't understand it because most of the staff were black. And it was one one like white guard that worked there. He was the SIS. <laughs> and one of the I, matter of fact, I was walking through the metal detector, right, with this my autobiography. And you know the guy that worked at the metal detector in Atlanta. I forgot his name, Harley, whatever his name is. Um, he saw the book and took it and gave it to the SIS and was like, man, he's running the business because he saw the picture. He's like, who is that? That's you. I'm like, yeah. He was like, what you doing on the cover of a book? I was like, I publish books, you know, about me. And he was, so he sent it to the SIS and the SIS guy called me down there. And he said, man, he said, they feel like you're running a business. He said, man, all these guys here that are selling drugs and all. He said, why would I, why would I be concerned with you selling books? He said, man, this will, he said, this is what we should be encouraging incarcerated people to do. He said, man, I would love not only to read your book. He said, I read it. He said, but I want to meet with you when you get out and sit down at Starbucks and have a cup of coffee with you and, and, and collaborate with you with my knowledge in law enforcement and corrections with gangs and stuff like that. And your knowledge in the streets and prison, he said, it's a population of people that won't listen to me. It's a population of people won't listen to you. And if we come together, we can reverse this situation that we have in America, you know? So it, it varied from institution to institution, but it, I must say that being in USP Atlanta and seeing people who had my same lived experience as far as a racial experience in America um, and the level of indifference that they um, presented to me for what I was doing positively, um, it was disheartening, you know, but you have to be able to, for those that's listening on the inside, you had to be able to take that, um, not personalize it, but use it as motivation to continue to do good because you have to, what kept me out of the confines of the prison culture, the, the gambling, the drinking and things of that nature was first the love of my mother, right? So I had, I had something to fight for. I had my mother who never gave up on me. And then two, you know, the love of my wife, you know, so, um, when you have something to fight for bigger than yourself, you know, I needed that. Those love letters, those visits, those phone calls um, from my mother and my wife, they were critical for me because it was a reminder to me, not only that I was fighting for my self-worth, but I had to get home and take care of my mother before she passed away. I had to come home and, 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 and be, uh, the man that I was, 
articulating these these beautiful poems and love letters about to my wife, you know, and I and I felt a deep responsibility to those that's listening on the inside um, to get out and represent to the world that it is some good people inside. And and I wanted to come out and that's why I published 11 books when I before I got out, because I knew like I just didn't want to be the guy that wrote a book. I wanted to show the world like no, I wrote 11 books. Right. And then once I got out, I knew that everything that I wanted to do, I wanted to do on a high level, not to boost my ego, but to be an example to the world that instead of putting children away in a cage for decades, they could have sent me to an international boarding school. Because I took my pre-SATs when I was 11. I didn't go to jail illiterate, right? I just was poor and I saw an opportunity to pull myself up by my own bootstraps from selling narcotics, which was an illegal and an immoral choice for a kid. But that, that same ambition to be something in life more than my impoverished environment could have been channeled to something that could have added to the wealth of the nation as it's doing today. So a large part of me avoiding uh, the, the, the climate, you know, the negative elements of prison, because it's positive elements as well, was just that, man, I, I just wanted to show my mother, man, that, you know, I, I was more than just, you know, a thug. You know, that, that, that story is so powerful that if somebody can find something, as you said, bigger than myself to live for, you've got a reason to, to, to avoid negativity and focus on what to do positive. One of the lessons that I heard from so many of my you know, fellow people in prison when I was going through the journey, and I'm sure you heard it too, but I know that you rejected it just like I reject that message is the best way to serve time is to forget about the world outside and just focus on your time inside. But if you do that, you end up just you know, perpetuating this intergenerational cycle of failure. But if we follow leadership, like Halim Flowers, you come out and, and you're able to build a phenomenal life. Yeah, actually, while I was in I, this book right here, uh, Time, How to Do It, Not Let It Do You. Yeah. I actually published this book. This one I was in for 17 years. And I say this book of force inmates a blueprint to use their time and the system productively. Um, the author wrote this manual after serving 17 years in prison to give prisoners a step-by-step -step guide to utilize their time to develop pro-social habits that will help them transition into society successfully and prevent them from becoming recidivists. This book is a must read for every person that finds themselves inside of the prison system that never wants to come back again. So it was bold to write this book in my 17th year because I was still in. Yeah, so I was making a statement like, look, this is a blueprint. If you follow this, not only will you transition back to society successful in the sense that you won't be a recidivist, but if you follow this, this way to do time, I'm guaranteeing you that you will change something inside of yourself that the law of attraction will attract high level things to you in society. And you'll find yourself in spaces and society around people and institutions that people would never believe that you deserve to be, you know? So, um, and I'm just so thankful and so humbled, um, you know, all the glory be to the creator that I, I was blessed to manifest everything that I wrote about in, in, in this manual because um, I really just, I really just like was so, blessed to have mentors that directed me to books and newspapers and, and magazines that just elevated my, my being. And I wanted to contribute um, in my generation, right? Because Malcolm X, you know, a lot of time people like Malcolm X and that was their time. That was the sixties. This is my time. Yeah. Right. You know, and I wanted something for my time to where as though like in the book, I, I mentioned like, the power of, of social media. And at that time, I never even had access to social media. But even then I knew, I was reading about it in the Wall Street Journal. And I was like, you know, man, once you get out, you can use your Facebook, your, 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 your Instagram, your LinkedIn. You can use these things to be able to connect with like-minded people in the world, you know? And um, 
So it was a blessing. And if anybody who ever had the opportunity to read and it impacted them in a positive way, I'm, I'm grateful. So, so you, you eventually, you told us about getting married in prison. Did you meet your wife while you were in prison or did you know her before you went in? I, um, my wife is nine years younger than me. So when I left society, uh, she was seven. I was 16. But she was a little a, a young girl that I knew from my community. I knew her mother. And um, but I, you know, when she when I went to jail, she was a kid. I didn't get back in contact with her until 2008. My dad used to send me pictures of people in the community. And um every July the 4th, they have like a little block party. My dad sent me some pictures. And you know, was girls in the picture. I'm like, who is that? Who is that? And he's like, oh, that's Lauren, that's Karen's daughter. I'm like, damn, you know, my wife beautiful. <laughs> like, damn, I'm like, that's Lil' Lauren? Man, I'm like, how old is she now? He's like, she, she like 18. And I was like, damn, I said, I wonder, do she remember me? Like, can I, actually, can I write her? So that was like, um, I met her 11 years, met back up with her at my 11 year point, And then we communicated for 11 more years until I got out. But I waited till I got out, till I got married. Um, wow, that's a great story. I my silver. I knew my wife when I was young. I mean, I knew I looked like Stevie Wonder. I don't know if you know that song by Stevie Wonder. So I, I I knew I loved her even then. Yeah. Know? But I was close to her. Young, but, but she had the good sense to stay away from me when I was young. So we weren't even friends. Yeah. But we did get married inside of that uh, federal prison, and we've been married now for twenty years. So you know, it's it's just been a blessing, and a, a, a lot of great things opened up because of that relationship with my wife, just like it happened for you. So reading, so you reading your book, man, it, I fell in love with your wife, man. You know, <laughs> like anybody who reads that book, man, like. It's a lot was, of hope for people in she's prison. A star of, she's a star of the book, man. Like what she went through and what she sacrificed, man. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful, man. I, it's just so, I'm so happy to just see you all together, man, you know. Well, we want to see you. We want to come to D.C. and see you. Or if you come to uh, uh, Orange County, California, we'd love to, to have you come stay with us. We'll probably we'll probably do both because my wife and I, um, I'm actually doing an art thing in St. Uh, Helena in Napa Valley in, in, in next month. Um, next in month? April, in April. Early okay. April. Well, let's, yeah. con let's connect. But continue telling us this story because you've had a, a really – phenomenal resurgence in, in, in life and getting out. Tell us now if this last part of our interview, if you could, about, I know you got a, uh, uh, you said that you'd spoken about a movie that you did while you were still in the juvenile facility, mm -hmm. but now you're, you're working on something that's, that's really impressive. And mm -hmm. I know that you're around a lot of powerful people. I think all of that is because of the decisions that you made while you were in prison, but I'd love to hear you tell us how your, your uh, adjustment back in society evolved. Um, first of all, when we did the documentary in 1997, when we filmed it, it was at the adult DC jail, okay. right? They just had a juvenile, two tiers for juveniles, uh, going to adult court. What's the name of that documentary? Uh, Thug Life in DC. And is that available still today on YouTube? Um, uh, it's on YouTube, but it's, it's. You know, the YouTube stuff is spotty. I'll send you the link. To send the me the link document. so I can weave it because the people in prison, they don't have access to it. But I want to show them a little clip about yeah. that. And but but that happened right at the start of your journey. Isn't that right? right? That happened at the start. At the end, um, you had the Supreme Court cases coming out about the juvenile brain development. And so it was just like the right timing. And once D.C. legislators were ready to do the resentencing law um, in respect to the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment for uh, juveniles just being over sentenced, over punished. Uh, of course, with every law, they need a poster child. So through my books and, and the connections that I made with my books, when they had the public hearing for the, uh, the new law in the D.C. City Council, I, I was able to have a, 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 a friend from a local organization to read my testimony at the hearing and to be able to submit my testimony from prison. And they were able to like to use my accomplishments on the inside to be the poster child to calm the public sentiment 
um, you know, about us returning back to society after being, you know, labeled as super predators. And, you know, so um, so that was a blessing. We was able to I was able to be used for that. And the law was enacted in 2017. I was released on March 21st, uh, 2019. And um, I was a 10 person release. And once I got out, you know, as they say, you hit the ground running, I kind of hit the ground flying, you know. Because you because of all those seeds that you've sown while going through, what did you do, 20 years? 22. All, while going through 22 years in prison, you work hard, you keep a positive mindset, you stay focused on success. And mm -hmm. after 22 years, you don't come out and have the same challenges that other people have. Instead, you, you come to society stronger than many people who are out here. Tell mm -hmm. us about that experience for you. Well, a big, a big inspiration for me on the way out um, when I left, because I left Atwater in 2018 to go back to DC jail. And I read your book, uh, How I Became a Millionaire in 20, for 27 months or something like that. I think it was, I, so, so the story of that book is from Matavusian. Here's how right. that started. I was uh, giving a speech at a judicial conference and he, well, he used to be a captain in Lompoc. And he mm -hmm. and, and I did I was doing the same like you. I was doing the same thing that I do out here. I was doing in prison and he locked me in the hole for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was in the hole, you know, but I've been in the hole a lot of times part of the journey. And I got out and now I'm speaking at a conference with judges and prison administrators. And there were like a thousand people in the audience and he was in the audience. And he comes up to me and he says, you remember me? I said, of course, I remember you. You locked me up. For this. <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed. And he said, you know, I'm the warden at Atwater now. You want to come out and give a presentation? I think the people would appreciate it. I said, you know, I can do that, but I think it'd be far better to create a course. And, and, and I said, and, and I'll create something special just for the fellas in Atwater and in prison. And so in like 30 days, I wrote that book, How I Made My First Million Dollars Within Getting Out in Two Years. Right. or something like that. I still have the book. It's on my website, but it tells the story. And it's really the story that, that I learned here. I'm hearing from you. If you right. make good decisions in struggle, you, you become more successful than, than maybe we have a right to be. But uh, yeah. that's so what I got out. I got out in March, 2019. So one thing I used to always push back with this prison administration staff, you know, they always tell you to go out and get a job, right? And I was like, no, I'm going to go out and create jobs. That's right. right. So I just had a different mentality. And I fought to have that because even, even when I may have doubted on the inside, was this pragmatic? Was this realistic? Um, I still kept that attitude, right? Because I knew I couldn't be a, you know, I have, a, I have ambitions to be a billionaire. And I'm like, I can't be a billionaire working for somebody. You're on the um, way. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I got out and one of the first uh, uh, income streams that I developed was uh, fellowships. So I had learned about these fellowships. So I had got one fellowship uh, with an organization called Echoing Greens, one of the biggest social entrepreneurial uh, fellowships in the world. And um, through the company that I created on the inside, Unchained Media Collective, we actually applied for it when I got out, before I got out. So the week that I got out, we learned that we had made it to the final round and that we had to go to New York City to pitch, right? So I had only been out for like 20 days and they put an ankle monitor on my leg. And I remember going to New York City and going there and just like speaking and pitching and like everybody that was there, because people from Germany, Switzerland, I mean, Africa, and they just like, what like they couldn't believe it like you've been in prison for 22 years how did you get here yeah. they're like i've been applying for this fellowship for 10 years like you've been out for 20 days and you here so it was good i got that and that was like forty five thousand a year for that and um and then i got another fellowship at an organization so, wait a minute. so the fellowship gave you forty five thousand dollars a year that basically gets you stable allows you to pay right. rent have some food and continue working on your craft Right, right. So they, it gave me some seed capital. And then uh, another fellowship that I applied for the first week that I got out, I ran into the deadline 
it's an organization in DC in Georgetown uh, known as the Halcyon Arts Lab. And what they do is they give you $10,000, a condo in Georgetown, and a, a studio space. And they connect. Is that, in, is that in Northwest? DC? Yeah, in Northwest. Okay. Georgetown is like the, the upper, well, upper. Yeah, where the university is. Right. You okay. Know, the upper echelon, you know, yeah. uh, the Orange County. Uh, yeah, I got DC. it. <laughs> and um, so what it did for me, and it was a, it was a fellowship for artists who use their arts in the interest of social justice. So it was perfect. And at that time, I just was a poet. You didn't have to be a visual artist. So I was a poet. And then I started doing spoken word performances when I got out. And I would perform in the orange jumpsuit with the shackles and belly chains on and it was different than anything that anyone was doing out here. And um, but what I was saying was, that, OK, it gave me a free place to live for a year, more monthly income. Right. And a space to create. So I had two sources of income, a free condo and a studio, which was like an office space. Right. So from that, I was I was just I said, OK, now I have my seed capital. And I have a platform in Georgetown in DC that gives me access to the 1%, right? And then I have access to a, a social entrepreneurship uh, fellowship that was based in New York that was global. So once I became a, a member of this fellowship, I was in communication with alumni from all over the, like Van Jones is an alumni of Equine Green. Uh, Michelle Obama's alumni, Equin Green. So I had this, this, I had a billion dollars worth of social capital that I was tapping into globally and locally. And then from that base day, I just would go places. And one of my greatest mentors I met um, along my journey, uh, I did a talk on MLK Day in January 2020. And it was at the Apple Store in Union Square in San Francisco. And I flew in, I did my talk, I had my books, you know, at the Apple store. And afterwards, the people at Apple took me to dinner. And it was this unassuming middle-aged white guy just sitting next to me. And he's like, hey, man, you know, he's asking me all these questions. Like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, well, I just started. I do my talks. I sell my books, got my fellowships. It's like, what else you do? And I'm like, well, I, um, I started doing these, like, visual art pieces where I take like pictures of me or from the Wall Street Journal and I write poetry on them. And he was like, how many do you have? And I was like, I think I got like 11 of them. He said, I fly you back out here, man. Uh, you know, and I'll buy, I'll buy one of each. He said, you like basketball? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, Who? he said, you want to go to a Warriors game? I'm like, nah, because you know, everybody was hurt that year. So he laughed. He like, she said, who you like? I said, I like the Lakers. He said, well, we play the Lakers next month. And he said, you know, by the way, I'm an owner of the Golden State Warriors. <laughs> right? <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we meet that way. And, you know, at this time, I'm selling these pieces of art for like $2,500 a piece. Right on. So when he's like, man, you know, I'm going to buy one of each. At that time, I hadn't even sold one yet. Right on. Right. So now I'm like, oh, okay. So he fly me back out. He let me stay at his mansion right there by the Golden Gate Bridge. And I remember waking up in the morning to pray because it's, it's like his, his estate is like right there by the Golden Gate Bridge. And when, when I would go to the hole and, and lock up in prison. Was it was it on, on the San Francisco side or the Marin side? It's on the San Francisco side. OK. It's, it's, I forgot the name of that neighborhood with all those little houses. Well, it's there's right the there Marina by, District there. And then, but but a lot of people live on the other side in Marin and Sausalito or Tiburon. No, 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 this on the San Francisco side. So so okay, I, like I know you, that area. You go, you go to his backyard, yeah. and if you walk down his steps, you'll be right there, uh, maybe uh, a few hundred feet from the Golden Gate Bridge. So for people who don't know, that's probably a twenty million dollar piece of property. Yeah, yeah. It was. A, I cried when I woke up in the morning. I'll saw the ocean. Cause I used to, when that, when that, when they would lock me up in a whole solitary confinement to keep my sanity, I would always envision me being home praying in the morning and watching the sunrise after I prayed. And, and I did that there. And when I met him, it wasn't, it wasn't the money that I made on that trip. 
it was it was it was a feeling, right? Yeah. It was being accepted, of being accepted in society. And for when what he you took, yeah, and when he took me to the Golden State game, and we went through like the you know the owners where all the owners was at, and they, the owners at in, in Golden State they got their own rounds, and and I remember they called it like Billionaires Row, like where the owner said that, and he told me he was like. He said, you're not here because I feel pity for you. He said, you're here because you, you are elite. He said, you see them on the court? He said, they are the elite basketball players. And, and everybody on this road, we're like the elite investors or whatever we do, we are elite. And he said, I, I'm investing. In, I'm not buying your artwork because I pity you. He said, I see you as a startup, you know, a startup business because he's an investor. And he said, I'm investing in you as a starter and I'm getting ahead of you as an artist before the market gets ahead of you. Right. And man, right after that, COVID came. So keep in mind, I'm making my money from speaking engagements. Yeah. And selling books and speaking engagements. So now when COVID comes, all my spoken word performances, all my speak is canceled. Right on. Right. So right, right. Right when we go on quarantine, I had received a grant from the Art for Justice Fund. Right, and the Art for Justice Fund, for those who are listening, it, it's a, a art collector named uh, Agnes Gunn. She watched the documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay about the 13th Amendment. And she was so moved by the documentary, what was going on in the criminal legal system, she looked at one of her paintings on her wall, which was a Roy Lichardson painting, and she sold it for $150 million and started this Art for Justice Fund to give money to artists and creatives who are using their art in the interest of criminal legal reform. Wow. And um, so move forward. As soon as the quarantine hit, I received this grant. And the grant was for me to travel to district attorney offices throughout the United States and to exhibit my photo, photo poetry pieces of me uh, with the poetry written on pictures of me incarcerated as a child and to do talks at different DA offices throughout the country. Now the quarantine come, I get the money, but I can't travel, right? So the, the, the fund said, well, just use the money to do whatever, you know. So what I did was I said, you know what? I've been going to these museums and these art galleries and I believe the art is trash, but they making a lot of money. Right. So I was looking like at a painting in the background. I was like, I can do that. And I could put a message on that, you know? And so I took the 40 grand and keep in mind, my wife was pregnant. She had just bought a house. I took the 40 grand and I started investing it into painting. And I turned the 40 grand into a million dollars. Man, that is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Selling your paintings. Selling paintings. And where can we see your paintings, copies of your paintings? How could I get that so I could show people what they look like? Um, you can go to the gallery that represents me or the website. I'll send you the link. DCR Modern Galleries. But they have locations in uh, Boston, Nantucket, uh, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Palm Beach, Florida. So all all East Coast. I can't um, wait. I can't wait to show that link and, and to write out not only so, show this video, but I'm also going to create a lesson from it so that people can read what you said, what I would have learned from you had I seen this story when I was locked up, how it would have inspired me to work on developing my education, to developing my verbal communication skills and writing skills, critical thinking skills. And what's what I really hear in your story is the power of, a, of having a self-directed work ethic, not waiting for the system to change your life, but learn how to change it yourself. We've been listening to a real mastermind, Halim Flowers. I'm going to have a, a, a full lesson and show notes and links to all of his work with my hopes and encouragement that you contact him if you want to buy something, show him your sneakers again, whether it's the sneakers, whether it's the backpack. We've got to support heroes like this who show, hey, you might be in prison, but that's not going to stop you from being successful or being a, a um, you know, a, a leader in society. This is a man who I think generations going forward can look up to. I know I look up to him 
and I'm super proud and honored for you to have been a part of the Prison Professors Program. Halim, and, and you have a new documentary coming out on Netflix, isn't that right? It's HBO. HBO. Tell us the name of that. Uh, it's going to be titled Super Predators and Superhero. Am I allowed? You sent me a, 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 a sizzle reel of that. Would I be allowed to, to put that, splice that in here so that yeah. people can see it? Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to make sure that I do that so that, so that people who are watching this in jail or prison can see what best possible outcomes look like as long as you can keep that hope alive and not let this system define you. I am Michael Santos, and I'm so grateful to have Halim Flowers on the show. Thanks, Halim. Thank you for having me. I just did a self-portrait, and one of the things I put was super predator. I was incarcerated at the age of 16 and given two life sentences. For me, growing up during the crack era, the culture is calling young black boys fatherless, godless, and jobless. We have predators on our streets. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are super predators. In a hyper-capitalist society like America, poverty is just violent. It was so easy for us to destroy each other. When you find yourself inside of a cage as a child. It's not meant for me to be around any people, places, or things that I love. I was alone with all of my pain. But my childhood friend, Mama Lou Stewart, is a rapper. And just being around him, I just started like freestyle rapping. Come on, baby. Go ahead, man. Right. Like the a little SG. Gave me that seed to blossom into poetry. I was liberated. I learned how to love myself. That's what I needed to become an artist. When I go to the canvas, there's something that I had to say that was meant for the world to see. My life is an example of the potential that lays dormant inside of these walls. You have so much genius right here, and it's just dormant. I'm fighting for y'all on the outside. I love y'all. People want you to run away from your past. They say that we were super predators. I turned this into a superhero who loves unconditionally. There's power in that.